Well, the loss and damage um, negotiations should have ended uh, last week with the negotiators, but they kept on at it and they actually went on the entire night last night until this morning and still couldn't resolve it. So it's now gone to the ministers. Hopefully they will be able to resolve it before the end of the week. And the fact that it's gone to the ministers, what does that tell us about how the discussions have been? Well, it tells us that it's a highly political and contentious issues that the technical negotiators didn't feel competent enough to resolve, although they did resolve quite a lot of the text. So there's a lot of text that has been agreed in the technical part, but it's the political part, I think, that requires the, the ministers to come in. And it revolves around whether or not there's an international mechanism for loss and damage, which is the demand from the EOSIS countries supported by other developing countries and something that Annex 1 are resisting. And effectively, as I see it, but you, you know better, so you can help, help, help explain this to our viewers, but effectively, is this a compensation track? So countries which are badly affected by, say, Pakistan recently, the flooding, they could come to someone and say, well, look, to the de developing world, you caused this because of your emissions, therefore, ergo, we want this much money. Well, I think the reluctance to uh, open this track and keep it going uh, has been that it, it opens the door for discussions about compensation. In a sense, loss and damage is a euphemism uh, for that, accepted euphemism. Uh, the question is, uh, but then there's still a lot of technical work that needs to be done. Exactly what is the loss and damage? How do we measure it? How do we attribute it? So there's a long way to go before questions of uh, genuine compensation might arise. But it does open the door, and that's why they want to close the door. And is the door being closed, or is it being slammed? Is there absolute, um, <laughs> is there ap uh, are developing countries, developed, sorry, um, absolutely adamant this, this is not going to happen? I think the opposite is the case. They have been absolutely adamant for a long time, because this is not a, no, uh, a new issue in terms of it being raised. It's new in terms of it being accepted to be discussed. Uh, the AOSIS countries have been raising this now for the last 10 years, but only recently has it been taken on board as something worth discussing. So I think the, the opposite is the case. Developing countries are not going to allow it to be slammed, whatever the developed countries want. So if they want anything out of Doha, they're going to have to give on this. And how much does this particular um, strand of talks um, feed in and take out of um, other debates, such as um, equity discussions and um, common but differentiated responsibility? Are they, are they effectively one in the same? They are very intimately related, although this is somewhat of a new track and therefore it's still something that is in evolution. It's not fully agreed, which is one of the reasons why the developing countries want to continue it. So the, the, with the continued work program, for example, uh, there will be opportunities to discuss the various aspects of it, including an equity aspect of it, and to at least come to some agreement on some parts of it, if not all parts of it. Uh, and therefore, this should continue and not be uh, closed down in Doha. And in terms of the arguments for and against, the arguments for seem fairly clear, but in terms of the arguments against, can you give us an idea of, uh, of what the, those kind of sticking points are? Well, the argument against being made by some of the Annex 1 countries is that there's nothing new under loss and damage. It's mm. all old stuff, adaptation, we can deal with it in adaptation, uh, science, we can deal with in substance. So let's just put it in the different parts that we already have, and therefore we don't need a separate track on loss and damage. Um, I don't think they're going to get away with that. There, there is a very strong logic that this is something new. It's about the limits of adaptation. It's about the limits of mitigation. What are we going to do when we reach those limits? And we will reach those limits, and we have to talk about it. Mm. I mean, it, in a sense, it seems quite an interesting development, although you've said it's been around for 10 years, and um, I think I'm right in saying it's really started in Cancun. But we're effectively talking about a strand of negotiations which acknowledges that dangerous climate change is going to happen and that we need to have a plan. It's, it, in a sense, it's quite a, that's a sort of seismic shift, isn't it, for a, for a uh, sort of an organization which is mm. aimed at stopping climate change? I think so. My own view of this is that Doha really marks the beginning of what I would ter term the third era of climate change, the first era being the first decade of mitigation being the solution, and we put all our efforts in that with Kyoto then realizing that mitigation wasn't going to be enough and we needed to do adaptation, so we've had a, a whole decade of doing adaptation. Now we realize either of those aren't really r working. We're going to have to deal with some residual damage and loss and damage is that new issue. And the Framework Convention is not geared to dealing with the problem 
after it occurs. The framework convention is to prevent the problem, but we fail to prevent the problem, so the convention is going to have to deal with what do we do with that failure. Um, the UK Climate Minister, Greg Barker, was asked a question about this in a, in a press conference about an hour ago. Um, and he made what I thought was quite an interesting uh, observation. He said that there's more responsibility on nations who have emitted substantial amounts of carbon dioxide after the science was clear than there was before, um, which is a, an interesting mm -hmm. argument. And what, what, do you, what do you make of that? How could that potentially feed into the, the kind of loss and damage debate? Because I suppose in other forms of law or justice, mm -hmm. that argument might actually wash. Well, there is some logic to it, but this, at this point in time, the loss and damage issue is about how to deal with real losses and damages. It's not about attributing, it's not about compensating, it's about the realizing and accepting the fact that there are going to be very, very real losses and damages around the world. And this isn't just a developing country issue. The, the rich countries are going to have them. New York just had about $100 billion worth of loss and damage. Okay, so it's an issue for all countries. We need a logical and an acceptable way of dealing with this and coming up with solutions for it. And the, the, the question of blaming and compensation, I, to me, is secondary. It is part of it, but we don't have to tackle that right now. Okay, and I guess just a final point. In terms of um, how important this is to two different blocks involved in this process, is this a, um, is this a kind of deal breaker in terms of whether or not some people will you know, continue with this process or at least continue with this conference? I think it has become a deal breaker on behalf of a significant proportion of the developing countries, namely the AOSIS who led on this, now strongly supported by the least developed countries group and the Africa group. That's over a hundred countries and that's a majority in the UNFCC. And if they stick to their guns then it's a deal breaker if they don't get what they need.